flag of the United States of America to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Um, sorry we're running a little bit behind. We're involved in a uh, board workshop discussing goals for this upcoming season, um, or upcoming year, I should say. Um, a couple of things I wanted to comment on. Uh, board members, just a reminder that uh, the MSMA conference is uh, occurring on October 22nd and October 23rd. Uh, if you can attend any one or both of those days, I recommend it. I glanced at the list of um, programming and uh, some of those things look really interesting and pertinent to what we're doing in this district. Um, the key thing is you need to get registered by the 10th of October. So. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact uh, Vita in central office. I think she has registration forms. If you've never been to one of these conferences, um, I highly recommend attending even for half a day just to interact with some other board members and, and see what's going on in the state. Um, Regarding open seats on the board, and I'm going to mess this up, but, um, and Steve, I'm going to need you to correct me. Uh, first, I want to welcome Lou Ensel, who um, was nominated at a special meeting by the municipal officers to fill the interim seat that we have open right now. Um, there are, Lou's term will go, and Lou couldn't make it to tonight's meeting, uh, but he will be with us um, from the next meeting until January, which is when uh, that's, that seat will get elected in November, and but that person is not seated until January. As far as I know, Lou has taken out papers for that seat as well, so this will be a chance for Lou to get his feedback. Um, the other open seat uh, right now is Steve August's seat, and that, under the new configuration, is an at-large seat. I'm pretty sure it has the first restaurant. Unfortunately, I think we have passed the deadline to take out papers for that seat, and as far as I know, Steve is the only one who has taken out papers. In the future, under this new configuration, we would like to see more people get involved um, in running for the RSU 1 school board. And last, uh, we will have one new student member joining us, and that is uh, Noah Shreden. Um, and I had Noah's information, and I left it at home. Oh, it's here. Okay. So, uh, we will be welcoming Noah, I guess, at the next meeting. It's just going to be a little late, so you should go to college for an event. Okay. Um, but generally, uh, Noah is very active um, at Morse High School. She's been uh, particularly active in a lot of um, volunteer activities and nonprofits. Um, She's a Bath resident, and we look forward to having Noah join us as a student member on the board. So, I will move on to uh, item 4.0, uh, approve and amend minutes of August 24th, uh, 2005 and 2015. Motion to approve by Steve. Second by Bill. Any further discussion? Any changes? All right, all those in favor of the motion to approve, please raise your hand. 
Okay, that motion passes. Thank you. All right, item 5.0, adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments, Patrick? Just one field trip. Yeah. I think you have on your table there to Boston from BRCT Center. <coughs> So I don't know if you want to put that after Ferry Beach. Okay, we'll make that item 11.2A. Excuse me, to Boston. All right, item 6.0 is our first public session. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak? Okay. Um, no staff reports for today. All right. Um, item 8.1 under committee reports, uh, the Morris High School building project. Uh, we need to specifically have a new versus renovation discussion. Um, I can leave this unless there's something that you wanted to add, Patrick. No, I would just say that We've been at this for a while now. We've had community meetings. We've had discussions. We have several different committees with a lot of participation from the, from the community. Um, the decision or the recommendation from the board at some point about new versus renovation um, needs to be made in conjunction with the Department of Education as well as Bureau of General Services um, as we go through this process. So. I think we felt like tonight was a, a good time to either ask questions or for board members to, you know, weigh in on their thoughts um, about new versus renovation. But tonight is just a discussion, and that, um, you know, again, the discussion would be shared with the Department of Education and Bureau of General Services and, and our architectural firm. And then I believe we do plan to have. I'm not sure if it's going to be October 7th or not, but soon in October we plan to have an evening um, community forum that would just be focused on the new versus renovation for anyone that would like to attend. But we'll put it on our website and get it out to the papers once we have the date and time um, solidified. So again, just to follow up on that, um, We've talked all along as this process has been taking place that to some extent we've been running a parallel course. Um, internally we've had to decide uh, which is better for the district to look at the renovation uh, versus building new. At the same time, that other course that we've been running is looking first at available properties within the district and then um, as we've identified potential properties, uh, doing um, wetland studies and vernal pool studies and identifying engineering challenges along with reaching out to the owners of those properties and getting a sense of whether or not they are uh, willing to sell. It's reached a point in the discussion where the board really needs to make um, at least a recommendation whether we should um, lean more towards renovation or more towards um, building new. And I think it's important that tonight we spend a few minutes, get input from the board. Um, as Patrick said, initially we had discussed uh, taking a vote this evening and my feeling was that we postpone a vote. Um, we have one more public meeting specifically around this, this issue, and then either take a vote that evening or at a special board, uh, special board meeting. But that said, the discussion needs to start here. It's sort of, you know, we've been looking to the, to the state and to um, the architects for some direction. The architects have been looking to the community and the engineers for some direction. Um, the state had, feels that they have a stake in this because they're fronting the money. But I think ultimately the board needs to take a position um, as to which way we want to go. 
So before we start that, I will just go over um, the uh, document that was sent out. I don't know if you all saw this. It came from uh, Ron Lamar, the principal with Lavelle and Rensinger, uh, regarding somewhat their involvement. Uh, having reviewed the existing Morris High School site, we are for the following narrative to document the discussions and criteria that factor into making the decision to build new rather than renovate. The existing Morris High School site does not have the acreage necessary to support the high school program, such as uh, lack of space for safe vehicular movement in and around the site, lack of space for building additions, which will further impact the parking and vehicular movement, lack of space for educational programs, including athletics and community use, lack of space to accommodate the logistics of an occupied phase construction project while school remains in session. Essentially, using the existing site for additions and renovations will take an extended period of phased construction and will not be the most cost-effective solution. So that's the gist from the architects we hired. But again, this is a local decision and um, it starts with the discussion that we have here at the board. So I open the floor to input. Jennifer? Um, I think one of the benefits to um, not trying to renovate the current Morris building and to build a new um, would be not just those people who responded they want to sell or not, but we, to do a big construction process there, I would just imagine it would cause an awful lot of upheaval for a lot of residents to try to manage a big renovation construction project in the middle of a <coughs> place. So that's one of the reasons why I think building new would be a, a smaller impact and burden to the bigger community would be that that construction process would take place someplace that wouldn't disturb the daily lives of the residents in the area. Um, that was one of the options of, and it also, building new wouldn't disturb the educational process of students while the new building is put into place. I know, you know, I know that, that Woolwich had to relocate because we read, built a new school on our very site, and that was hard for our community, our school community, to be without our school. And you know we were separated in different buildings, and everyone did a fabulous job with that. But I, one of the nice things about building new someplace else would be we could keep our kids from being disrupted for those that time frame when the, the new building was coming up, was being built, and we would have the least disruption to the residential community and the least disruption to the education students if we were to build new instead. Thank you. Anyone else, Steve? Well, I, I, I agree with uh, most of Ron's uh, recommendations on this. I think there are limitations to the existing site, which are quite apparent to everyone. Uh, just to, to echo uh, you know, Jen's comments, staging, and I think in Ron's mind, the staging of this one, of were we to do an exhaustive and extensive renovation of the existing building, result in, you know, shutting the floor down or renovating moving students into other parts of the building and moving them into that renovated floor and shutting down, you know, the, a subsequent area of the building for renovation. And I think, I think it, it, it adds cost and it adds time to the budget. And, and I would be, I'd be interested in Isabel's comments on this too, but I think, I think the disruption to the educational experience of kids would actually be exacerbated and be dragged out of a longer period of time. Um, you know, Morris, Morris has been with the community for, for a long time um, and served the community well, there's no question of that. And it's not being disrespectful of that legacy and you know, all the tradition that's wrapped up in the building to say, well, you know, the time has passed when, when that facility actually adequate to, to the needs of our kids um, in the community. And, and what, we've, what we've talked about um, in, in some 
the subcommittees that meet on this issue is, is to capture elements out of the common building, even physical elements, uh, mantles, uh, you know, lentils, whatever they are, and, and move them into the new structure to, to try to take some of that positive uh, feel that, that the community gets out of the current course and carry it into the new structure. But I think it's pretty clear that, that in my mind, anyways, it's pretty clear that the new structure is the way to go. And, and I think in the long term, serves our kids, it will be more cost effective. Um, and, and I think we'll get the project done more quickly if we're trying to struggle with the comments. Anyone else from the board? Isabel, did you want to as a suit? I um, sort of threw her. Yeah. Well, as a, as a current more student, you know, the building, I think, is definitely, like, there are lots of traditions things that people really appreciate and there's a strong link to you know students in the school but at the same time the school just isn't really fit for you know the amount of students that are in it right now and I think that like I know that there are a lot of issues just with parking like that my friends have experienced and I think that um, a lot of the worry about building a new structure is that the traditions of course will be lost or they will there as much, but I think that that's not necessarily true. I think that you know, the building, although it is a big part of tradition, at the same time as people who are in that building, and it's you know the history, not necessarily that one structure. So I think that building a new structure would really you know, could provide more opportunities for students in the future. I think that might be the best solution. Why? And, and I'll echo what you said, um, you know, having been part of the visioning committee and, and, and reviewing a lot of the work that's been done by staff and students who have been interviewed, one of the things that they say that there is an incredible culture at Morse and inclusiveness at Morse, but the thing to keep in mind is, is that that culture that exists is because of the people and the staff, and it's not a function of the building. And in fact, at times, the building may work against that. Yeah. Um, and they, the, the architects, in talking about the possibility of building new, they've certainly made a point of um, respecting um, some of those unique features that exist in Morse and making sure that if they were to build new, that those features, uh, in, in some shape or form, would get incorporated in the new design. Um, I would definitely echo uh, Jennifer's sentiments in, in that I feel that to try and do uh, a major renovation at that building, we would be doing a disservice to the students for three or four years who were attending the high school to have to go through that process. And I think um, it would just be too much to ask of both the builders work within that confined space, you know, no place to store equipment, no place to store materials, and the students to have to, who would be, you know, at that time, have to endure um, through that kind of renovation. So my inclination is to move towards towards the Megan? Yes, um, I definitely agree with you and the things that you said. Uh, sorry, I get really nervous talking up there. <laughs> Um, but like what she said, that Morse doesn't really fit the people or the students right now, and I feel like Morse just doesn't really fit to like my vision of the <coughs> as a district and where we wanted to go. And um, and I am a former Morse student, and so I have you know those memories and traditions and stuff. But to me, I also think it's the best to move forward, and you can still, like you said, bring those traditions over. Um, because the two, I did go to one of those meetings with the alumni, and the two things that were brought up a lot were um, the pit and uh, the Montgomery Theater. So, you know, so, and then uh, the disruption to the students, too, like, I don't, with Woolwich, I feel like they had almost an advantage because Hughes School was, was an option, and I don't, you know, we don't really have an option now to, 
um, help displaced students. I agree with everything that has been said. I think that we would be really shortchanging the educational program if we were to renovate the high school. I don't think we can do enough to that place to bring it up to today's educational standards. History is wonderful. But I think if you look around the state and stop and think about it, there are many high schools that are still going on that are new. Winslow, Waterville, Coney, and probably, you know, those are three that come directly to my attention because I lived in that area. But their spirit of the students and the history and so forth can be moved. It doesn't have to stay and be buried where it is. Cost effectiveness, no question that your place is going to save us a lot of money and will help us introduce some programs and things that we struggle with on, on a yearly basis trying to bring in. Thank you. Bill? Wes, uh, transplanted from Massachusetts as I am, I don't have the, the history with Morse. But as I have become engaged in this process, have attended several community meetings, uh, met with faculty and administrators, it's very, very plain and clear that there is a culture at Morse that's very, very special and needs to be uh, maintained. But I, I, as someone else said, feel that that culture can be maintained in a new building. And certain artifacts things that are very emotional to the community. Ron Lamar has already said that they can be detached, removed, and transplanted into a new building in a place of prominence so that those tr traditions will actually have some tangible evidence of those traditions. Uh, the irony of this is, I said I'm transplanted from Massachusetts. Ron Lamar was the lead person when my alma mater in Massachusetts, which was of the 1928 vintage, again, similarities, uh, was moved into a new building. But the students were able to maintain a full four years, it was almost five, while the new building was being constructed. And then there was a very orderly process moving the educational programming and the student body and the faculty into the new building. And he led that, uh, that effort and we're fortunate to have him here because he's experienced at it. He's very sensitive to the needs of the community and the culture of the school. I'm tremendously impressed. And I had called the superintendent down in my old hometown and said, what do you know about Ron? And he said, you're going to love him because he really gets into it and he'll do what's right for your community. So I, I guess I vote for him. Okay. I wanted, I wanted the alumni and alumni to go first. Okay. All right, well, as I said, as a board and, and for the benefit of the community, I think on one hand we want to move this process along as quickly as possible. And I think as soon as this decision is made, um, it will sort of clear the air in terms of what direction we're headed. But at the same time, I think we, we have an obligation to the RSU1 community to have at least one public meeting specifically geared towards this discussion in case there are aspects that we haven't considered. Um, but generally, I get a sense from the board that there's consensus to leaning towards uh, new versus renovation. So the hope is, I think, as Patrick said, um, October 7th, is that correct? Yeah, October 7th, which is a Wednesday, um, that we would have one public meeting um, to specifically discuss this issue. And hopefully at that meeting or there shortly after, we'll put this to rest and, and, and move on with the project. Is there anything that anybody else from the board wanted to add before we move on? Okay. 
Okay. Thank you for that discussion. Uh, item 9.0, uh, superintendent's report. Patrick? I would say that we read all of the principal reports, director's reports, that we had a very positive start to the school year. Started out day one having Travis Roy come, who was a former uh, BU hockey player and also <coughs> and uh, we had a bunch of right. yeah, right. um, professional development <laughs> professional development included over the first month of school anything from proficiency based education to teacher evaluation to everyday math, the new addition to restorative practices, and we also continue the Lucy Hawkins writing work that we've been doing. Um, a couple things just to mention that was helpful to our community and our families is Roos Reusable. We have a contract with every year, thanks to the Davenport Foundation. They contributed several hundreds of backpacks with school supplies to our schools to help families and students that may need those supplies. And at the same time, we also are thankful for the backpack program that we have for food purposes uh, on the weekends that is supported at Dyke Newell and Fisher Mitchell, and I believe will be expanded to Phippsburg soon. Uh, brochure I have for you here tonight that I'll hand out to you at the end of the meeting so you can look at is the end product of a brochure for Morris High School that basically highlights the programs, the things that are going on in Morris. There's quotes from current students, alumni, parents, and staff, as well as a list of the programs and activities that we offer. And our goal is to be able to make um, quite a few copies of this uh, high-end brochure and distribute it around the communities, realtors, and also to the prospective parents and students so they can get a better understanding of what's occurring at course. Last, I'll just give you an update on flow. I think everybody here, but I'll just quickly um, read through this piece. But this experiential learning opportunity is for all eighth graders in the district, and it pushes students outside their comfort zones and creates relationships and memories outside of the traditional classroom. The students may uncover capabilities and interests that are not evident in the classroom. This year we'll have 123 students going, which represents a participation rate of 88%. This is an increase of 21%, or 27 students, from year one, when we had 96 students go, which was a 67 participation rate in 2014. This year we also received $15,000 in donations from various organizations and businesses, as well as private donors. The focus of this year's trip is on writing with a connection to the lives of historical explorers. Some questions that are being asked out there right now to our students is, what did it take to thrive out in the wilderness? Why did some expeditions succeed and others fail? What does it take as a group to work in harmony? What specific challenges are there? So students have time to journal out there this week. This is the third week out of four weeks. And the first two groups had much better weather than this group's gonna experience this week, I think. Um, in addition, Chihuahua staff is teaching about tides, geology, shoreline, biome, constellations, and weather. And students will also learn skills such as navigation, paddling, cooking, and low impact camping, whatever that means. Lawrence gave you that piece. I think camping's camping, but that's all right. Um, all, re all reports from students, chaperones, and Chihuahua staff have been glowing so far. I mean, we've had maybe a hiccup or two, but everything has been very positive and we'll be holding a culminating event at City Hall on November 20th, and our students will be um, sharing their writing, and it will be the first edition of the Flow Anthology. And I would say that so far, we've had the Portland Press Herald, we've had the Coastal Journal, I believe we've had um, the Forecaster and possibly the Times Record all cover um, this program at one time or another, as well as to Chihuahua, um, one of their editions of their their booklet, which I think I sent to you last year. So it's going well, and I would thank our staff, especially Lawrence Kovacs, but I would also thank our teaching staff at BMS, as well as at Woolwich. Um, we have teachers that are wanting to go on this trip, and they're leaving their own family behind for a week, and going out there and working with our students, which we really appreciate, and also appreciate the efforts of Chihuahua as well. Any questions for Patrick, Jennifer? 
Yes, Patrick, um, is there any way that we could tell how the writing um, goals in flow are directly related to Lucy Hawkins? Um, and are those, is that kind of writing one of those writing styles, one of those writing um, skills that we're assessing at that grade level? Um, and I'd also like to know that I just saw a field trip that's going to have the seventh graders go on a uh, science a science trip for three days, so to a science school. And I'd really like to know, since the seventh grader are doing that in seventh grade, how that how Flo uses that information and how they tie those two experiences together. And besides writing, it would be very interesting to know how those um, academic points that Flo is making, how they tie into specific assessed requirements in terms of the eighth grade curriculum requirements. It would be nice to see more of those targets hit or how those targets could be hit um, in terms of what that experience gives for them. Um, it's, you know, it's not that we're doing it just to hit specific targets, but I think it would help us understand how important it is to take time outside of school and to take the resources that, and the budget that's going towards flow to see how we could, how much response we're getting to the implementing assessment. Is that something that we could ask a flow for this year in terms of the Lucy Hawkins questions or something that we could ask for the flow program maybe as they're reflecting on what happened this year for planning for next year? Lucy, yeah. well, if you want to chime in, Judy, but I mean, as far as Lucy Hawkins go, as well as um, learning targets for you know, how it relates to our specific eighth grade science or math or anything else, um, we can certainly put that on you know, our agenda as we reflect this year. I think the big focus that we did this year was on the curriculum piece, which I think has been uh, a positive thing as far as the writing piece uh, because of our focus on writing instead of what we did last year. And our teachers put a lot of time and effort into that, especially in the, the science and writing across the curriculum. But Judy, do you want to add? Yeah, um, this is our first year doing this conference at the middle school. So it really, there's no direct tie in there yet. Um, we just, in fact, we haven't had any professional development loose conference there yet. We are starting in October. Um, so eventually there will be a tie-in, but there isn't yet. And I do know that I wasn't directly involved in this work, but Lawrence and uh, several teachers worked on, uh, I think it was at the very beginning of the summer, worked on the alignment of the flow uh, experience to regular curriculum. So I'm sure we can get that information here. And you think that we could have some tie-in between the seventh grade trip and this trip in terms of it's the same group of students that have those students have probably done the seventh. I don't know if they, if those students do that did that seventh grade experience or not, but it would be really interesting since it was in the same natural environment has a lot of tie-ins in the science or in science between the two. It would be interesting to see if they had a connection. And I can just add to that because I'm a student, I mean, I'm a son who did Ferry Beach last year okay. and just came back from Flow. Uh -huh. And one of the things that I found um, was uh, Lawrence had worked, as Judy said, with the staff in integrating the curriculum that they experienced um, on flow with their regular school curriculum. And, and had, they'd done a really good job over what had happened last year. And I think some of the points that Patrick brought up were true, that the expedition that the eighth grade is doing this first half of this year is an, is an expedition on exploration. So that is tied directly to what they were discussing, the book they were reading out during on flow. The writing piece, that was critical because as we try to integrate more writing into the curriculum at the middle school level, that was a key piece of what they were doing every day. Um, the science piece, uh, from what I understand, um, there was a specific uh, lesson on distillation, distillation of water. Uh, drinking water. Um, it was sort of a, a real world application and also a lesson that they experienced um, out at Flow 
that translated back to what was going on in the classroom. The math piece, they hadn't been able to work out because, um, as well, because certain kids are in one math program and certain kids are in another math program. But those kind of makeups are being are happening um, as you know as they transition back to the classroom and other kids transition out. And so, did it tie into that seventh grade? Did your son feel like you? Yeah. The, 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 there isn't a direct connection between the Ferry Beach experience and the flow experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I can only speak from you know, what my son said, um, is that Ferry Beach was a little bit more um, protected. Um, they, had, uh, they didn't have as much freedom. Um, they certainly weren't going out and, and camping on their own. So, from a growth standpoint, um, you could make a loose connection that a little more restricted with Fair Beach, uh, a lot more freedom at the eighth grade level would flow. But I think some of the natural resource stuff, um, there was connections talking about you know the, the environment that we live in, this community, this geographic beautiful place that you know where our schools are and talking about rivers and ocean and marsh and those different ecosystems, a lot of that stuff carried through. And, you know, as a last note, um, when my son came back uh, that Friday, there was a, a group of kids that he had been with and they all had uh, a soccer team that afternoon. So we sat around with a bunch of parents and I was kind of quizzing, you know, how was the experience? Um, and I'd say, you know, they had only seen their, their son or there were some daughters there for an hour or so. Um, but generally, it was very positive. But one thing that, you know, just to relate to you folks on how powerful this program is, um, there was one parent who said to me, uh, their son um, has camping experience, has been out in the woods with the family. So this was nothing new to him. You know, whereas for some kids this was all brand new. Um, but the parents said to me, the incredible thing, the impact that this had on my son was the fact that this was the longest my son had been away from us. And there was a huge amount of anxiety in this child about being away for that period of time to the point that they considered not doing it. And the sense of accomplishment that kid felt um, and, and how empowered they were, they said it was, it was transformational, that they came back and just felt like, I, I can move away, you know? And so that's a lesson, a powerful lesson that you don't necessarily think of when you think of that experience. But I think for each kid, what they took from that um, was very different. And there are a lot of positive outcomes that we didn't even anticipate, so. And I would agree with that. I, I experienced that with many parents and many children over the many years that we did the sixth grade program at Woolwich, that that was a huge part of getting ready to have them go away in eighth grade for the D.C. trip was actually being able to be away from their home. And a lot of them, even in sixth grade, hadn't had that opportunity yet, and we, and we worked a lot with practicing that before they went. A lot of those learning growth marks were not just academic. Yeah. And and I think that that's a it's a wonderful part for students who don't have that Woolwich sixth grade science trip opportunity. And I think Flo has done a wonderful thing is to give them that same a similar experience that had been going on in Woolwich for ten or eleven years now. It's wonderful that everyone else is getting that chance in the RSU to experience those kinds of things. Um, I think tying it in because there is a, a financial impact to the budget for flow. I think that we've got to make sure that, that we have so many opportunities to say how that ties into our educational opportunities to be able to next year come and look at that, making that financial contribution again. When you're not asking for such a financial contribution from both parents and the board, I don't know if your metric of, of measuring that has to be so, so steep, but I, I, I know that in Woolwich that we talked about how the fifth grade trip prepared students for the sixth grade Mount Blue trip, which prepared students to the eighth grade DC trip. And that was a constant 
conversation amongst people throughout their experience through fifth grade to eighth grade more, which was this is each step you take and this is what it brings you and all those skills. So I hope that that same connection is being made in BMS through all those different programs that each one prepares you for the next and that as teachers we're watching how you perform there to know if you're ready to make that next step too. So, yeah. so I think it's a wonderful program. I hope it continues to grow. All right. Oh, <laughs> this is this Noah? Yes. Welcome, Noah. We had some nice things to say about you earlier. So, uh, I'm glad that you could join us. Sorry you missed it. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, item 9.2, uh, financial report. Well, I don't have my podium, so I'm just going to work um, the financial report that you're looking at tonight is from the month of August, and uh, we have spent 5.9% of our budget, and compared to last year, last year we had spent 5.8, so we're pretty much right in target with where we were last year. Um, most everything that you see is for activity is any salaries and benefits for July and August and supplies and uh, contracts as far as copiers and that type of thing. You don't see uh, regular construction and salaries and benefits because those will come in on in September. Because we encumber everything in June, so um, salary and benefits aren't reflected on the financial sheet for August for teacher salary. Um, as far as revenue goes, we have uh, brought in 16% compared to 11 last year, so we brought in a little bit more money for this time period. I do need to update the local funding and the state subsidy by that 315000 that was um, transferred to the local side from the state subsidy. And those um, Local appropriations have been reduced in Bath and Woolwich, and we did an updated um, billing for them just a couple of weeks ago, so they're seeing that. Um, federal funds, I have to say thank you to Judy and Sandra and Justin for finishing the federal fund reports. So for Title I, Title II, and local retirement. And that brings in um, $1.3 million to our system. And that's about it. Any questions for Deborah? I have one. So, compared to last year, um, and I think I know the answer to this, but I was hoping to get a little bit more clarification. Um, under revenue, under tuition, uh, last year, we were estimating $270,000 in tuition. Uh, this year, we're estimating over a million dollars in tuition. I'm assuming that's revenue from West Bath. At what point are we, um, and, and who's responsible for tracking to uh, make sure that that revenue number matches incoming students and that the accounts are equal? I know that part of that agreement was that some point, two parties had to come together and agree on some numbers. Who's doing that, and when is that supposed to take place? Well, Vita and I will work um, on that once October first gets here, and then she finalizes the figures as far as the actual students, uh, and then we will look at what we budgeted versus uh, what's actually happening, who's actually out there as far as our she wants to. So we'll start looking at that next month. Would it be possible, um, and it just may be a consideration, Patrick, that in October, because we, we have those numbers by October 1st, that we get some kind of a report that says, here's how many students actually are attending, here's the revenue that's associated with those students, and um, because I know that student count doesn't necessarily, necessarily correlate to Revenue, and I'd like to see how that actually broke down. Okay, great. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, item uh, 9.3, this is not an action item, this is just for your review. Uh, fundraiser requests, that was in your packet. <coughs> Excuse me, I could have been cool. Um, any questions or comments on that? Okay. Um, we will move on to old business and begin with item 10.1, um, in the sense is new business, 2015-2016 um, board goals. Um, and we spent some time prior to this meeting discussing potential goals uh, for this year. I think um, we came up with five general goals, uh, the first being to continue the goal towards staying on track with the um, high school building project. And that encompasses everything from uh, timeline, costs, uh, communication with the community, um, all the work that goes along with uh, maintaining that we're on track with that project. Uh, the second goal, again, the continuation of a goal that we've had for the past couple of years, which is to work on uh, improving uh, communication with the community and within the district, looking at new means of communication, better ways to get out to the public, um, and better ways to uh, communicate with, with parents and, and students. Um, the third one, again, goal that we have every year. Uh, by the end of the year, we would like to review any new programming that we instated uh, this year. We'll take a look at that at the end of the year, get a report, find out how effective that is. And then um, the two new goals that we discussed, uh, number four, was by the end of this school year to uh, bring closure to the K through five uh, discussion uh, surrounding Dyke Moore and Fisher Mitchell. Um, and that would involve um, a, a recommendation uh, by the administration and a report with data to support it that gives the board some guidance one way or the other and brings closure to that issue. Which way are we going to go in the future? It's not to say that we'll make a decision then, but at least we'll have a direction that we plan on going in. Um, the fifth goal uh, was to get some feedback from the administration to entertain um, distinguishing or innovative or marquee programming that um, would be unique to RSU-1 as a district. Um, that report obviously could come at any time probably best around budget time, to see if there are some things that folks want to do within the district uh, that would cause us to stand out, um, be unique, um, and ultimately benefit the education of students. Um, so we're hoping to hear from the administration on that, so that that's something that we can discuss going forward. So I've, I've roughly framed um, the goals that we discussed don't know if there's anything that the board wanted to add to that in terms of goals. Um, are there any additional goals that I didn't touch on that the folks were interested in? So I think those are five good goals. Um, I wrestle with this every year. On one hand, I would like to vote on these goals and get them on paper so that it's something that we're thinking about and discussing at every board meeting. Um, and we may do it at length or we may just, you know, skim over it, but at least it's in our mind. Um, at the same time, I don't want to vote on something if we haven't, don't have strong language around it. So, um, I'd like to entertain a discussion as to whether or not we should make a motion on these 
or craft language that we uh, vote on at the next board? I honestly think that we should, if we've got the framework, we should put the pros around it, make it more specific, and bring it back to our October meeting for a vote. We've had the discussion this evening. Uh, folks may want to add something as they digest what we've uh, suggested, and we can do that in the interim, bring them to October's meeting and vote on them, and then start looking at them every month thereafter. Okay. That's my idea. See some nods. So, Patrick and I will work on crafting language. Steve, did you want to add? Well, I was just going to suggest that, that we you know, take a vote uh, to agree on those goals in, in concept so that at least we can, we can begin to work toward meeting those goals, even if we're not, you know, even if we don't have the language in front of us. At the they're, they're intuitive enough for us to understand uh, what, you know, what we're asking of the administration. Uh, meetings, but it just, it just gives us another, you know, gives the administration direction a month ahead of time. I mean, they, I think, I think that could understand is what we're looking for at this point, but it just put it on record and perhaps move things along a little bit more quickly. So perhaps without a formal vote, we could just get a, you know, a thumbs up or a thumbs down if these are goals that the board supports going forward. And that way, it, it just gives us that one additional month to send a message to the district that here's what the board is looking for, and they can get started on it as we craft the language to vote formally vote on it. look hesitant okay so just you know thumbs up or thumbs down um, in favor of those five goals for the 2015-2016 just a show of hands thumbs up okay so we have general consensus from the board that these are the five goals we're going to work on uh, between now and the next meeting Patrick and I will work on the language around this. Um, hopefully you'll see a draft or two. You can give input and we'll vote on the final language um, at, the, at the next meeting. But in the meantime, this gives particularly those folks at Dyke Newell and Fisher Mitchell one more month to start pulling some data together and brainstorming because uh, the year passes before we know it. Okay. Um, Item 10.2, uh, second reading of policy JIH and JIHR, questioning and searches of students and administrative procedure. Uh, this is an action item. Now, this is a policy that we tabled uh, at our last board meeting, and I think we tabled it, as I recall, for two reasons. One, Steve had requested um, some sort of specification about what qualifies as illegal when we talked about um, items that were being confiscated or possessed by students, what constitutes illegal, and I think I had requested um, an inclusion of some uh, formal report that would be consistent within the district um, so that all administrators, all schools were using same reporting if uh, a search had been done with a student. So from the policy committee, do we have that? Were those addressed? I can, I can take a stab at it and then you guys can add it. But uh, the committee met, we have a new person who's an attorney actually for the UVAID system. And we talked about the, trying to define a legal item and the committee felt like um, there may be something that we would leave out um, and that we just felt it was self-explanatory knowing what's in our handbooks or policies that we refer to. And then as far as the um, similar form, our, all of our principal use our infinite campus and use our discipline forms within infinite campus, our database, um, to do, you know, so we have a similar format and anytime we 
you know, search a student or that we have discipline, um, we use that as our, so I guess I would say, similar um, kind of note taking or format that we use. Steve, did that address your concerns? I'm not sure exactly what happened. You said that, that it was felt that it didn't, the, the handbook includes the definition of what constitutes. Yeah, I mean, different illegal items. I think the committee just felt, and I'll speak with you guys, but I think just felt that we put a, um, a list on there that we may not think of everything, um, you know, of what could be an illegal item. But it's in the hands. There's reference to weapons, there's reference to drugs, which I think are most of the things that were, you know, that would come under illegal items. Yeah. But Jen or Megan, do you want to? I agree. Yeah. You feel comfortable with that, Steve? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. that will be coming in for the year 
and he was able to come in and job shadow Kevin last week. Um, so I think it'll be a smooth transition. Any questions for Patrick on that? All right, uh, item 11.2. Um, this was in your packet. Uh, this is an action item to approve the overnight field trip request to Ferry Beach Ecology School. This is uh, for BMS students in grade seven. Move to approve by Steve. Second by Bill. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. And that passes. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, item 11.2A. This is uh, to approve a field trip to Boston. And this was included um, at the table. Is there a motion on this field trip? Move, approve. Move to approve by Bill. Second. Second by Steve. Any further discussion? Okay, this looks like it's just a one day, it's not an overnight, but it is out of state. Um, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. None opposed, that passes. Okay, um, item 11.3, uh, appoint school board representative to the delegate assembly of the MSBA. Um, this is an action item, and frankly, I recall seeing an email about this that every district is supposed to have a representative, um, but beyond that, um, I'm not all that familiar with this. Patrick, did you want to speak to this at all? It's coming from the School Boards Association. It's really to be in attendance on that 22nd to have kind of a business meeting as a group and um, to review, you know, business from the MSBA as well as probably some voting items as well. So is there anyone from the board who was planning on attending on the 22nd? Alan, would you be willing to be the representative? <laughs> okay. Um, and for, for an extra expense, Alan is willing to be the representative. Uh, would somebody like to nominate Alan? Nominate Alan Wall to be our representative. All right, Bill nominates Alan. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jennifer. Any further discussion, Alan? Do you want to talk about what those, if that additional, I'll buy you a soft drink or something? Right, a cup of coffee perhaps? I think that we can. Um, generate enough funds to make that happen. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. None opposed, thank you, Alan, for stepping up to that. I'm sure there's a huge amount of work involved with that decision. And I'm glad you were willing to take it on. All right, item 11.4, to approve the agreement for services between Dr. Hannah and Midcoast Pediatrics and RSU-1, again, this is an action item. This is an item we, a contract that we've had for a number of years. We do this every year. I don't know if you want to speak to this at all. She simply provides a service to our nursing staff and to our principals and um, any directors that may need it, but mostly works with our nursing staff um, to, as a consultant. Any questions for Patrick on this? It's a woman. Yeah, and she has. Yeah. I'm going to say as long as I've been on the board. Okay, move to approve by Bill. Second by Alan. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Okay, that passes.
Okay, um, we have uh, three first readings of the board policies. Uh, we will begin with item 11.5A. This is policy IHBGA, homeschooling participation in school programs. Um, and I think if there's any discussion, generally all of these, these three policies all fall within the same realm. So. Are there any questions, comments? I call for the first Either on the first one or the three in general. Do we have a question with latitude with these? Or uh, is this pretty much boilerplate uh, from the state? <coughs> we made some changes, and actually, I would, the way it works for you, Noah, is that we have a first reading with policy. And we um, will have the policy back for a second reading, and then it becomes then you vote on it. Uh, but I would ask, you know, Isabel and Noah, if you guys could, you know, those three policies. I think you know it would be nice to have a student perspective because we are talking about private school, we're talking about students charter school and homeschool participating in co-extracurricular activities. But this is something that has become, I guess, I would say, uh, a concern in some districts in Maine. It's something that we just would like to be a little clearer about. So we have had some boilerplate language, but the policy committee did make some changes and there's a local option to Yeah, to make some, some tweaks to it if we'd like. The thing I wanted to add or mention is um, again taking these policies together. Um, the first one refers to homeschooling, the second refers to private school, and the third uh, applies to charter school students. Um, with regard specifically to um, extracurricular activities, and I know this has been an issue in other places in the state, I've read about this. Under the charter school policy, um, in specific, specifically with sports or athletics, extracurricular athletics, there's a line here that says, a student enrolled in RSU1 schools will not be denied the opportunity to participate in favor of a student enrolled in a charter school. Essentially what that is saying is um, if there are tryouts for a team and there are only so many positions available, under the charter school language, it says that an RSU1 student takes priority over a charter school student. The thing is, with homeschooling and private school, um, that language is not as um, clear. With uh, the private school, it says, the criteria for selection of participants shall be determined by the staff members. Tryouts are by nature competitive. Eligibility to tryout does not guarantee participation. That's private school. And I think with homeschooling, it was even less specific as to um, where a homeschooling student would fall relative to an RSU1 student. So I'm, I'm thinking, unless there's a reason for this, I'm thinking that our inclusion or exclusion should be consistent regardless of whether you're homeschool, private school, or charter school. And I haven't given it a lot of thought, but I've given it some thought. I think fundamentally, while um, I think the trial process certainly is a good thing, I do believe that our obligation, first and foremost, is to an RSU one student over uh, a homeschool, private school, or charter school student. So that's my opinion without thinking this through too much. Um, Curious if there was a reason why there wasn't consistency amongst those three policies. I would prefer that provision in the first one be the same one in all three. These people have made a choice. They're paying to do what they wanted to do. Now they want something in addition to. I don't think they should have the cake and eat it too. thoughts on that? Well, they're, they're not necessarily paying either. I mean, the, the 
language, the language oh, well, <laughs> but I would, what I would suggest is not. In the Charter of Private School language, it says that the RSU may assess an additional share of the Charter School or to the private school for the cost. I would, I would change that to shall. You know, just, you know, if you want to play football, and there's the cost uh, to our football program, Charter school, you ought to pay for the cost to participate. Not, not, not may, not a discretion. But I think my, my, my question was. No, no, yeah, but to Tim's, to Tim's question, I and I guess my, my note here was, you know, last chosen, I don't know exactly what I meant by that. But participation, you know, this, this language would not necessarily preclude, I mean, I don't know what it means to participate. But we'll take football again as an example. You can participate in football by, by being on the team and sitting on the bench all the And, and the, the, the athlete who, is, who you're backing up is the charter school kid, but he, but he or she may have better skills. You know, could be football, could be soccer, it doesn't matter. The, the, and the coach, the coach decides, well, you know, the charter school student or the private school student has better skills. Two of you make sense. You, you go with you go with the, the athlete who has better skills. I, I would suggest that, that in, in an instant like, instance like this, it's really the RSU student who has the preference to play. I mean, none, none of these experiences are definitive enough to, to make that much difference in, the, in, in how the student, you know, how the how the, the individual lives out their life. I mean, we're not going to produce any professional soccer players, professional football players. Out there. But participation, I, you know, I, I think participation means not only the opportunity to, to join the team, or not to be precluded from joining the team and, and sitting on the bench, but also a preference to, to, to play the sport. Am I making sense? Little. Um, <laughs> Noah, and then Bill, and Noah, if you could speak into the mic. I was just wondering to, um, how large is the population of students that these rules apply to? Is there a approximate number? Large. Is it? Yeah. It has not become, I don't have the numbers with me, but it hasn't become a problem it, in our district. I think we've had one situation, maybe at the middle school level, where a student may have gone to a private school and they didn't offer the sport. And again, it comes down to, I know people have different definitions, but you see the word capacity listed in, this, in these policies quite a bit. And I think it's really our principal, our athletic director, or coach, make a decision. Do we have the capacity to take another student? And again, I know people can have different opinions about this, but when you take someone, for example, in that case, if that student, um, you know, does have the talent, then you know you, you may play that student instead of a student that may be going to, going to our public schools. And how does that work out? Um, but it hasn't become a problem, but it has become a concern in some neighboring districts and in southern Maine where it's, so we just kind of wanted to be proactive. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, the, the language, um, we can certainly look at that as a policy committee. The charter school language, we actually took some of that language from a, a, a couple of the districts that are, are having this, um, you know, this issue come up. And that's probably why there's a little difference in language. But to know it's quite a bit. How many charter school kids do we have? 10 or 15? No, we probably have there's a significant number of kids that could potentially, but none that have effect. none that have common that's as opposed to problem for for co-curricular or extracurricular activities. And that's K through twelve. Bill. Yeah, I, I don't want to prolong this. The old athletic director and coach uh, has dealt with this issue in the past, very, very, very seldom. Uh, You've got a whole bunch of apples and oranges. Uh, you've got non-cut sports, uh, track and field, cross country, you know, uh, and then you've got sports where a youngster has to be has to make the team. Uh, cut sports, varsity basketball, boys and girls, and so forth. So you're dealing with apples and oranges. You almost have to deal with it, have a general policy, which we have presented to us and then deal with it on an individual basis as the request comes from either the home school or the private school or the charter school student. Uh, 
Uh, once accepted onto the, the squad, however, I think that that student, regardless of where he happens to attend, uh, should be dealt with by the coaching staff and assigned a position on the squad. And for instance, if, if the youngster is without question a starting basketball player and he makes the team, then he should get playing time. And I don't think he should be discriminated against simply he or she simply because uh, he doesn't attend the school. If we're willing to accept them into the program, then it's up to the coach in terms of determining playing time. But I think to get back to my question, the point that I was making is you have three different policies here. One applies to charter school students, one applies to private school students, one applies to homeschool students. In the charter school policy, it specifically says an RSU 1 student, when there is a tryout situation and there's a limited number of spots, under the charter school student, the RSU 1 student takes priority. So even if a charter school student um, has better skills, under this policy, they cannot bump an RSU student. Whereas under homeschooling, if you're a homeschool student, it doesn't make that classification. And the policy under a private school student says something that falls somewhat in the middle that says it acknowledges that tryouts are competitive and yet there is priority to be given to um, RSU students, but that's at the discretion of the coach. So what I'm trying to get from the board is as we send these three policies back to policy committee, as a board, do you favor whether it's, I don't, I don't think that there's a distinction between a homeschool, private, or charter school student. I think all three of those should fall under the same policy. Either you go to school in the district or you're coming from out of the district. The thing I need to determine is, um, as a board, which do you feel? Do you feel that if it's a tryout situation that let competition prevail, and if that outside student has better skills and there's a limited number of seats on the team, then that outside student would make the team and the other student wouldn't make the team. Or do you favor the position of they all try out, but if there's a limited number of seats and it comes down to an RSU1 student and a student from homeschooling situation that the RSU student would get priority even if their skills might be lesser than the charter school student or the homeschool. I, I see homeschool kids as our kids. I mean, they, they, get, they get an RSU diploma. So you feel that there, sh there should be a distinction between these three students? Because homeschool students sometimes participate in our schools in other, in other capacities. Hopefully, a private school or a charter school student would be. So, uh, and, a, and a homeschool student doesn't have a facility that they're going to. So, I, I do think that the homeschool students are in a different category, although I think that it's still is good for our policy committee to talk about this distinction of preference and priority when it comes to limited resources in, in any capacity. Limited members of a team, limited uniforms, um, limited anything, the cost or the resources needed to include them. How do we address that? Do we, how do we make sure that as a mission we are servicing and providing for RSU1 students with, you know, foremost and then accommodating as best possible other children who come to our RSU activities to ask to join to do them. And I think we want to be both as inclusive to the children living here um, as we are want to be meeting for the priority of servicing students who are enrolled as our mission members. But I think it's a good question for the policy team to grapple with. I get the sense that we know that this is going to go back to the policy committee from here for, for its final language and whatever adjustments. I would suggest that uh, our athletic director sit in with the policy committee uh, when they're discussing this. And he may have uh, 
information directly from his peers, or he may have had um, circumstances where he's had to deal with the issue. I just think that his input would be would be helpful to uh, the board and the public. <coughs> Anyone else from the board? No one? Um, I know there's varying levels of participation within schools of home, uh, home schooled individuals. Would it be possible to do um, in order to be treated like a regular public school or one student, um, like a cutoff? So they take three courses at Morse, they're considered a, um, an RSC one student. If they don't, then they fall under the homeschool or charter school or public, uh, private school, or is that too much of a complication? I think to some extent, I think that was the point that Jen was making and that I didn't quite get in that if you are a homeschool student, we essentially would consider you an RSU 1 student, regardless of whether you took one or three, or that you are part of the RSU and that in an, in an extracurricular capacity, you would have a sort of equal standing. I guess the distinction is determining which way we go with the private school or charter school students. Do we want to be inclusive or do we want to give priority to existing large students? And I think it's a good idea to get that input you know, from the athletic director, but I think ultimately, um, once we get his input, and this is based on some reading that I've done about other districts, it's important that the board, you know, weigh in on that. So, any other discussion on that? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, um, item 12.0. Uh, public comment. Is there anyone else who would like to speak from the public? Okay. Uh, item 13, uh, sec set next meeting dates and location. We're currently scheduled for the 26th uh, of October at uh, Morse. Anybody have any issues with that date? Okay, I'm just going to add it to my calendar now. How do you get into the north criteria? Um, usually you go through the BRCTC entrance. Okay. You just walk down through. It's right there. session, item 14.0, uh, to discuss labor negotiations. Is there a motion? Sure. Move by Bill to go into executive session. Um, second by Steve. Uh, any further discussion? I will say that uh, for the student folks, you don't need to stick around for executive session. And since this is our last um, item, you're welcome to leave if you want. Don't stick around until we, until we wrap things up. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor uh, to go into executive session. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any votes we take? Yeah. I think. Yeah. I don't know. 